The story of the Northrop YF-23 is more than just another technical report on the creation of yet another prototype. It's the story of ambitious ideas, hard work, and hopes that unfortunately did not come true. This fighter was a true showcase of the cutting-edge technology of its time, wrapped in stylish, predatory stealth form. But why, despite all its advantages, did the YF-23 remain on paper? And what aircraft formed its basis? We'll try to answer all these and many other questions in today's video. The late 1970s and early 1980s marked a turning point in the global military confrontation. The Cold War, which had reached its technological peak, dictated the new conditions in which every decision in the field of defense could become decisive. The USSR invested significant resources in its own armed forces, rolling out two new fighters, the Su-27 Flanker and the MiG-29 Fulcrum, which posed a serious threat to the US Air Force's air supremacy. These vehicles combined advanced aerodynamic characteristics, high maneuverability, and good weapons which made the United States question whether the capabilities of its current air platforms, represented by the fleet of McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle and General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon, would be enough to maintain superiority in a potential conflict. The answer to this question was the Advanced Tactical Fighter, or ATF, a U.S. Air Force program launched in 1981 to create a next-generation air superiority fighter capable of leapfrogging both performance and capability by taking full advantage of new technologies such as advanced avionics and flight control systems, powerful engines, and most importantly, stealth technology. The requirements for the ATF, codenamed Senior Sky, were as ambitious as possible, formulated in the form of four main concepts. Supersonic Cruise and Maneuver SCM, is a highly maneuverable fighter aircraft with a takeoff weight of approximately 55,000 pounds and maximum possible power at transonic and supersonic speeds. Subsonic Low Observable SLO, a concept widely discussed within the U.S. Air Force Aeronautical Systems Division ASD, in which it was considered acceptable to sacrifice the characteristics and speed of a fighter for the sake of a small cross-section and infrared signature. Numbers Fighter N, lightweight, low-cost design trading lower individual capability for quantity. High Mach slash High Altitude HI, a large and fast missileer aircraft weighing more than 100,000 pounds, capable of flying at speeds exceeding Mach 2 and altitudes of 50,000 feet. After an even more detailed evaluation with potential contractors, the military decided to remove the last two concepts, N and HI, from the list, combining the advantages of the SCM and SLO options in one vehicle. The SLO was ideal for the air-to-surface class, while the SCM performed well in the air-to-air -air class. Simply put, the ultimate goal was to create a fighter capable of cruising above the speed of sound without the use of afterburners, highly maneuverable for air combat, and at the same time remaining virtually invisible to enemy radar. By 1983, the ATF System Program Office (SPO), under the direction of Colonel Albert C. Piccarillo, along with Tactical Air Command (TAC) concluded that the ATF should focus on air-to-air -air missions against new Soviet fighters as well as the long-range radar aircraft detection and control AWACS Baryev A-50. Air-to-surface missions would be carried out by dual-role fighter aircraft developed as part of the program to replace the F-111 Aardvark Enhanced Tactical Fighter as well as the then-classified Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk. TAC insisted on this option more. The SPO, in turn, showed a much greater interest in stealth, carefully studying the results of the black programs Lockheed Have Blue and the F-117 Nighthawk, Northrop Tacit Blue, as well as the Advanced Technology Bomber, which later resulted in the creation of the legendary B-2 Spirit. All of them, according to SPO, promised a strong reduction in the effective dispersion area, making it minimal in comparison with any commercial fighter of that time. So what do we end up with? Requirements for a takeoff weight of 50,000 pounds, a flight radius of 500 nautical miles at a combined subsonic slash supersonic speed, or 700 to 800 nautical miles at subsonic speed, 
a super cruise speed of Mach 1.4 to 1.5, the ability to use a 2,000-foot runway, and a maximum stealth capability for the future fighter, especially in the frontal sector. By July of 1986, this entire list was presented to contracting companies, which were divided into two groups in their desire to give the United States a worthy new generation fighter. The first included the Lockheed Skunk Works division, which regularly participates in the creation of the most daring aircraft, as well as Boeing and General Dynamics. The second group included Northrop and McDonnell Douglas. The hard work culminated in two prototypes, the YF-22 from Lockheed, Boeing, and General Dynamics, and the YF-23 from the Northrop McDonnell Douglas team. As you already know, our focus today is on the latter. Having noticed SPO's interest in stealth, Northrop rightly decided to put it at the forefront of its future device. Engineers who previously worked on the B-2 Spirit during the Advanced Technology Bomber Program proposed three main concepts for a new stealth fighter. Agile Maneuverable Fighter AMF, with two inclined vertical tail units and better aerodynamic characteristics but with minimal stealth. High Stealth Fighter HSF, balanced stealth and maneuverability due to diamond-shaped wings, all-moving V-tail rudder vaders, engine exhaust chutes, and specially aligned edges. Ultra Stealth Fighter USF, which emphasized maximum stealth thanks to the edge alignment with just four RCS lobes, was awarded the nickname Christmas Tree for its planform shape. Of the proposed options, only the HSF took in the most design features from the B-2 Spirit to reduce susceptibility to radar and infrared detection, so we decided to stop at this concept. Additionally, Northrop's ability to design and analyze stealthy curved surfaces stemming from their earlier work on Tacit Blue and the B-2 gave the team's designers a formidable advantage over Lockheed's previous reliance on face setting like the F-117, and subsequently lost to Northrop in the contract under the ATF program. Thanks to the regular development of the aircraft from the HSF concept, which it still closely resembled when the prototype was first introduced, the YF-23 shape was eventually improved greatly. The result was an extremely atypical fighter with an integrated aerodynamic design, diamond-shaped wings with a span of 44 feet with cut-off tips, symmetrically tapering at an angle of 40 degrees, both along the leading edge back and along the trailing edge forward, a giant V-shaped tail, partially leveling benefits from the variable thrust vectoring of Lockheed's YF-22 prototype, as well as a thin side profile like the legendary reconnaissance aircraft from one competitor company, the SR-71 Blackbird. The YF-23's unique faceted shape, angular surfaces, and flowing edges have been carefully crafted to minimize the radar cross-section reducing signature to even the most advanced enemy systems. The Lockheed prototype, on the contrary, failed to completely get rid of the gaps between the air intake and the fuselage, even in the final design of the F-22 Raptor, still going into production nonetheless. When creating the YF-23, engineers had to deal with many of the design limitations of stealth aircraft of the time, which made it nearly impossible to provide sufficient, consistent airflow to the fighter's engines. For example, with the absence of variable geometry air intakes, large bleed air doors, and also maneuvering ramps and cones, which slow down the air sucked in by the engines of the device at supersonic speed. However, Northrop was able to solve this key problem by installing S-shaped ducts. They hid the reflective surfaces of the engines from radar waves and effectively slowed the air during flight at supersonic speeds of up to Mach 2. Now what remained was to somehow overcome the problem of the boundary layer of air that spread around the fuselage during the flight. After drinking gallons of coffee over several sleepless nights, week after week, month after month, the designers installed mesh panels at the top and forward of where the YF-23's fuselage met the leading edge of the air intake. Small holes were drilled across the entire surface of these panels, which were responsible for sucking in the air from the boundary layer that stuck to the fuselage before it entered the air intake. This air then exited through a flat opening and several small doors on the top surface of the YF-23. In effect, it acted as an invisible separation plate, but instead of separating the air, they removed it completely. As a result, the design of the air intakes of Pratt & Whitney's YF-119 and General Electric F-120 engines installed in different prototypes was extremely simple. They did not hang under the fuselage as a separate structure, 
Instead, their trapezoidal shape simply ended at the bottom of the fuselage, being largely part of it. The concept worked like a charm and may have helped Northrop's prototype outperform its competitor, the YF-22 in Super Cruise. Hiding a huge fighter from enemy radar would have been even more difficult if the YF-23 team had not taken care of the heat dissipation of the device in advance. Even outside of Super Cruise mode, the device could emit up to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that enemy missiles would have recognized such a heat signature as quite the appeal. They decided to camouflage it in a very non-trivial way, by lining the exhaust ducts on the upper side of the airframe with tiles that dissipate heat, just like on the space shuttles for protection during re-entry. The unique configuration of the YF-23's weapons bay deserved special attention. While the YF-22 featured a fairly simple design with a shallow ammunition bay, the YF-23 offered one coffin-like cavernous weapons-carrying cavity that ran from behind the cockpit back into the area between the aircraft's widely spaced and very unique air intakes. This led many to speculate that Northrop's prototypes could carry significant air-to-ground weapons, including 2,000 pounds of ammunition and possibly more. The final configuration of the YF-23 wouldn't have likely had one, but rather two weapons bays. The large compartment would remain in the same place as the prototype, but the smaller one turned out to be right under the cockpit with several AIM-9 Sidewinders reserved for enemies. It was initially thought that the fighter could carry four or five AIM-120s and a pair of Sidewinders, but this number could easily be expanded to eight to ten AIM-120s. It all came down to the way the missiles were stored in the magazines or the use of the rotary launcher shape. It's not for nothing that Northrop patented a vertical magazine for fighter missiles during the ATF program. The YF-23's external features were complemented by its advanced hardware, namely the base processor, which is almost as powerful as an IBM mainframe computer due to its ability to perform billions of calculations per second. And, well, where would we be without fly-by-wire, which completely eliminated mechanical connections between the pilot's controls and the aircraft's control planes? They were replaced by a network of sensors, wires, and processors that instantly processed the pilot's commands and transmitted them to the actuators. It was fly-by-wire that allowed the YF-23 to remain stable with its revolutionary design with a unique V-shaped tail, which improved stealth but required complex stabilization algorithms. So why with all this was Lockheed's YF-22 the winner? The fact of the matter is that by the time the prototypes were presented, the Cold War had come to an end, and along with it, the U.S. defense budget began to decline. The Air Force needed a very compelling argument for the further production of the newest ATF fighter, which now has no opponents left. This is where Lockheed's marketing power came to the service's rescue, as well as the fact that of the two devices, only the YF-22 successfully launched the AIM-9 and AIM-120 as part of the tests. Yes, this was not a prerequisite, but it made a strong impression on the military, not to mention the more traditional design of competitor Northrop. All this seemed to be a less risky bet over choosing the YF-23, the creators of which, by hook or by crook, sought to save taxpayers' money by using the chassis from McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet fighters, as well as the nose and cabin from the same company's F-15 Eagle. But apparently the experience of cost overruns on the B-2 Spirit still played a cruel joke on them, adding extra gasoline to the fire of concerns for the U.S. Air Force and Congress. Granted, despite the less risky choice, the planned fleet of 750 production F-22 Raptors, into which the Lockheed prototypes evolved, was eventually reduced to 187 devices, mainly due to the high cost. So who knows, really, maybe Northrop might even be lucky enough to break the string of accusations of cost overruns by postponing such an impressive concept until better times. After all, stealth has not become any less relevant today, and who knows how many ideas could be pulled out from under the YF-23 fuselage for future 6th generation fighter, next generation air dominance. You think Northrop has a chance to revive the once great project, or is its time already gone by? Share your guesses in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell for more content like today's. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.